of this day hallelujah Hallelujah. but I can sit in expectation and anticipation on what God wants to reveal unto me on tonight to help me with my situations that are to come and if you feel the same way you just ought to give God glory Hallelujah. hallelujah I sense his presence I sense something coming I've been waiting on it I'm going to receive it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm not going to let anything distract me from getting it. Hallelujah. 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 It's going to be an intimacy with God on tonight. First in the natural, then in the spirit. You can look around and see that there's going to be intimacy on tonight. Hallelujah. That's a special time fireside chat with the Lord. Amen. Amen. Check the website for all updates and announcements. www.tphdim.org What's up? 2015 Seasons of Refinement Men's Conference. Hallelujah. We ought to be glad when the men are being refined and strengthened in the body of Christ. 
when they're coming together and building one another up, that's something to give God glory about. April 29th through May the 3rd. Amen. Spread the word. Share it on your social media so the men in this city can come together and be refreshed. Amen. Refined and restored. New Bible training opportunities. Amen. Uh, the second and the fourth Sunday, singles and married couples empowerment classes are on Sundays at 9 a.m. We know that that's this Sunday coming up. On the first and third and fifth Sundays, foundation and di discipleship classes are happening. Amen. Please, please continue to pray for our sick and shut in and our bereaved families. Amen. Amen. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pastor. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endures unto all generations. Father God, we magnify you all tonight. We bless you, God. We praise you, God. We worship and adore you, God. We thank you for being in the midst where two or three are gathered. You are there in the midst. Holy Spirit, have your way on tonight. We thank you and we sit in anticipation and expectation about what you're going to do for us all tonight. Bless the man of God as he break forth the word of life, God. Restore us, replenish us, oh God. Just build us up, God. Tear down what needs to be torn down, oh God, and build up what needs to be built up. We're here at the potter's house, oh God. We want you to reshape us and remold us, oh God. Make us look good what pleases the potter, oh God. Not what's pleasing to us, but what is pleasing to you, oh God. That we can do great exploits in this city, oh God. That we can go forth as more than conquerors in and through Christ Jesus. Lord, we love you, and we bless you. Bless this worship ministry to break up any foul ground before the man of God comes. We declare this atmosphere is conducive for your spirit to move. Rest, rule, and abide in this place. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Somebody give God glory. Hallelujah. Come on, praise him. Come on, praise him tonight. Come on, praise him tonight. Anybody glad to be here tonight? Uh, anybody glad to be here tonight? Come on, praise God with us. Thank you. 
One more time. Come on, Lion. Come on. continues to play let's open our Bibles right to Ezekiel chapter 24 verses 15 through 18 and then we'll we'll read that in the New International Version and then we'll read Acts chapter 20 verse 24 <clears throat> challenged with a word today that as I prayed and was led to this section of my study and given by the Holy Spirit and taught by my bishop and articulated Today, I guess, Holy Spirit, vicariously through me, is going to challenge and comfort us. Amen. It's a blessing and a challenge. It's a blessing and a challenge. Ezekiel chapter 24, verses 15 through 18. And the Bible says, The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, with one blow, I am about to take away from you the delight of your eyes. Yet do not lament or weep or shed any tears. Groan quietly. Do not mourn for the dead. Keep your turban fastened and your sandals on your feet. Do not cover the lower part of your face or eat the customary food of mourners. So I speak to the people in the morning and in the evening my wife died. The next morning... I did as I had been commanded. Acts chapter 20. My God. Did nobody say amen? It was hard right there. <laughs> I'm going to read that last part again. We're going to shout anyway. So I spoke to the people in the morning. And in the evening, my wife died. Jesus. The next morning, I did as I had been commanded. Yeah, yes. Somebody just try to shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Yeah, just try. Acts 20, 24 simply says, But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race, what? With joy. And the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Father, help me tonight to stay excited through this word. Help us to hear tonight with anticipation that our lives are shifting and catapulting into a place of optimal ministry where we'll do and allow you to do great things through us, regardless and in spite of every situation and every circumstance. Help us to figure out how to flow in your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Look at your neighbor and just say, wow. Grace right in the middle of it. You may be seated. Thank you, Craig. Right in the middle of it. This particular text always pricks my heart. It was the text that God gave me before I really even had a, an inkling of understanding that it was in the Bible. Uh, I had no real correlation uh, with remembering this word and God gave me this word a couple of days before I received the news while I was yet in the great 
uh, university in Kentucky uh, that my mother had passed. It was a couple of days before she was passing, and God gave me this word, and I couldn't understand why I had this word. I couldn't understand what it had to do with me. I called home, and uh, at the time, my wife was okay, and, uh, um, and I was just trying to, fiance at the time, and just trying to figure out what was God saying or doing, and could not really put it together until it was come to pass. And so it pricked me, and so today as I was reading and studying and just kind of musing through the morning and then through the afternoon praying, uh, I was led to the study of this particular text and the notes that I had concerning it, and I thought what better time to uh, bring out the challenge according to the grace of God than right now. Uh, my few words on Facebook from the bishop's heart has all been about grace uh, and what this week means after you come out of a week like we came out of celebrating the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, how to move on from that moment is in the grace of God. And nothing uh, more compelling than starting your life out with a challenge. Uh, I think about the Lord Jesus Christ and our life is patterned after him because we said that we are the body of Christ. When he came up out of the water, great words were spoken over him. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Just before that voice and before he dipped in the water, John said, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. So it was obvious that there was a call, an anointing, and a purpose on his life. But as soon as he came up out of the water, as soon as the dove had descended, as soon as the words were spoken, the Bible says that the Holy Ghost drove him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil isn't that funny how God can call us and then let the devil tempt us in one stroke of the pen and so here it is that we have this type of life that we see uh, we call it parallelism and we do it throughout the text we do it with David we do it with Elisha and tonight I believe Ezekiel uh, is our subject it's a word that kind of deals with obstacles and hindrances and things that would get in the way of the move of God in our lives. Things that would kind of interrupt what we would call manifestation. Things that would call, cause us to pause or to have to hold back or not move the way we thought we were going to move or with the same expeditious attitude that we thought we were going to have. And often we find out in our own lives that, um, uh, turn it down just a little bit, it's bouncing, our own lives that uh, it, it's a lack of obedience to God that can hinder the manifestation of our promise. God did say it and God did mean what he said, but because we weren't obedient or we didn't stick to the instructions, amen, uh, our promises seem to be delayed, so to speak. Every promise in God is yes and amen, but you can cause there to be a delay in the promise manifesting because all of the promises have a prerequisite prophetic word attached to it. Uh, if you keep your eyes stayed on me, then shall you have perfect peace. I will give you perfect peace whose eyes are stayed on me. The peace will come, but you got to get your eyes back on Jesus. Amen. And many of us pray and ask God, where's my peace? God says, where's your eyes? Yeah, it's what you're looking at that's causing you the problems. And it's not what I said, it's what you're paying attention to. Because whatever you pay attention to gets magnified in your own eyes. And so uh, we've got to make sure that we do things according to what God says. You know, uh, if your praise is mediocre and if your worship is weak and your giving is slack and the word is watered down, why would you expect anything to come to pass? Ain't nobody going to say nothing in your life. Uh, the things that we've been hoping for. We, we can't give God a little bit of something or half of something and think we're going to get all of what God said uh, just because. But we, we've got to align ourselves with the pattern of God. We've got to align ourselves because uh, and it's this pattern for our lives that allows the move of God to happen on the way that God wants it to happen on our behalf. We've always said it uh, since we've heard it uh, from our bishop, my bishop, first the pattern what? Then the glory. So God will promise the glory, but there'll always be a pattern with it. 
And with all of the hell that's going on, we need to be getting ready for the greatest move of God that any generation has ever seen. Uh, it's crazy out here. Things are just amok. Stuff and situations are crazy. And folk catching it on film and just putting it right out there. We just got another tragedy of a police officer, the people that's supposed to protect and serve, the folk we're supposed to trust in South Carolina, just shooting folk down in cold blood and then had the nerve to handcuff him after he was dead. Yeah, I don't know. I don't understand it, but it's a setup. God's setting something up. He's looking for a people, a redeemed people, a, a, a motley crew, if you will, some, some remnant to step up and do what God has called him to do. You see it, more sin, much more grace. Grace is what God has given us in the earth to provide for our vision. Grace is provision for the vision. Sin darkens our path, but grace brings light to it, and it empowers us in spite of us. Somebody say amen. And so I believe, I'm, I'm, I'm almost there and I'm almost through. I believe that the church's time to shine is right now. I believe, and we've been saying it for the entire year, that there's no greater time for the body of Christ to stand up and be who we are than right now. The problem is, right now ain't the best time for everybody. God says right now, but we saying, hold up. You don't understand what I'm going through. You don't, un well, I'm about to get ahead of myself. But God is raising up a people. He's raising up an army to kind of turn the tide, kind of get things back in the right direction. And in order for that to happen, some of us going to have to swim upstream. Yeah, some of us are going to have to go against the flow. It ain't going to happen the way we thought it was going to happen. Oh, it'd be nice if God laid it out with tulips and all of that kind of stuff and you get to jump through the daisies and it would be feel good and feel nice. You have all the money you need, everybody around you acting like they got sense, kids lining up, spouses lining up, job giving promotion, car running, ain't got to worry about it cutting off, ain't nobody calling about bills, DPNL is straight, Vector is straight, water bill is straight. All of you got new customers. Things is just going hunky dory. Everything's working out for you. It'd be real nice if it was like that, but I got news for you. It wouldn't be ministry if it was like that. It wouldn't be God if it was like that. Why? Because the grace has come to prove that whatever we accomplished, we did it because of the grace of God. But God is raising up some people to say, so what? Somebody say, so what? Isaiah 59, 19 says, when the enemy comes in, what? Like a flood. The spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard. Look, somebody say a standard. There's a standard with the word of God. There's a standard in the kingdom of God. There's a place of excellence and prevailing and conquering with the word of God. And that ain't supernatural. That's the standard. Ah, see, we done got the enemy to make us think that when we prevail, that's something extra. That when we get over, that's something extra. That when we get through, that's something extra. He done tricked you into thinking that that's the extra stuff. When you say winning is the standard, excellence is the standard, prevailing is the standard, getting over is the standard. Why do we act like God didn't give us a promise? But problem is the enemy has entrapped our mind and entrapped our bodies in such cases that uh, we don't really know what our standard is. We don't really know what the promises are. We don't really know what it is and what it means to be a child of God. The Energizer Bunny got more anticipation than we do. We run into a wall, we just quit. The commercial I saw, he bounced and turned and kept on going. There was something about that bunny, something about having resiliency, something about having tenacity that won't let us shut down just because things didn't go our way. But this is going to take an effort. God's bringing some people together. It's a mixture of the old and the new. We've called it, Bishop has uh, pointed the way that it's the Joshua generation. Uh, you're part of an old generation and a new generation mixed together. Keep in mind, the Joshua generation is not youth. So who is it? Numbers 14, 21 through 25. But as surely as I live and as surely as the earth filled with the Lord's glory, 
Not one of these people will ever enter that land. They have all seen my glorious presence and the miraculous signs I performed both in Egypt and in the wilderness. But again and again, they have tested me by refusing to listen to my voice. They will never even see the land I swore to give their ancestors. None of those who have treated me with contempt will ever see it. But my servant Caleb has a different attitude than the others have. He has remained loyal to me, so I will bring him into the land he explored. His descendants will possess their full share of the land. So who is God calling? God is calling loyal, faithful people who follow God wholeheartedly. Remember, Caleb at this time was about 85 years old. So it doesn't matter what your physical age is, young, middle age, or old. God wants to use you. What matters is the condition of your heart, your commitment, and your willingness and obedience to God. God is looking for those who follow him wholeheartedly. That doesn't mean you don't make mistakes. That doesn't mean things don't go wrong. That means that no matter what happens, you follow in God. Those who are loyal to his leading, they are connected to the unction and the prompting of God. They're not telling God no because things didn't go their way. They're not saying I quit because some stuff went down that they didn't like. They stay as enthusiastic about serving and leading and being led by God as they were when everything was working out for them. Yeah, this one ain't easy, but it's okay. He wants to empower them as his mighty warriors to go and take their promised land. Somebody say, take it, take it. Yeah, I don't know what whimsical little uh, thought that you have that you're dealing with a wimp of a devil. He's not going to give you your stuff back. You've got to take it. So then what is the condition of your heart? How obedient are you to God and his leaders in leadership? That's how you become a part of the Joshua generation. I'll put it on the screen. The Joshua generation is a people anointed to lead other people to their promise. People anointed to lead other people to their promise. Readying the next generation. Folk raised up to take people where Moses could not take them. One of the marks of a Joshua army, uh, as uh, explained and expounded upon by my spiritual father, or this next move of God, is powerful because it's, it's, it's kind of uh, an anomaly. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit the status quo. Uh, it actually goes against sometimes what we teach as theological faith. Here's a mark of the Joshua army. God's getting ready to use folk that declared themselves unusable. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you figured that your situation had disqualified you, even in your fake shout and run. Deep down inside, you're saying, uh, God can't take me where I thought he was taking me because I've got this new situation that I'm dealing with. I've got this old lingering thing that's been on me uh, that won't let me go. And here's the, here's the trip. Others didn't even say you wasn't fit. Yeah, ain't nobody going to say nothing in here. God. But you've been murmuring to yourself. Oh, God, you wouldn't even use me like that. I, I wonder why I can't get used like that. Oh, I know why. Uh, because the devil's been beating you down and making you hide behind your shortcomings and your secret sins. Beating you down with weaknesses and the pains of your past, making you think that you are unqualified for the work of the kingdom. God prompts you to do something, but you say to yourself, he can't be talking to me. So I'm supposed to just say tonight, just like we say when we played that old game as kids, come out, come out, wherever you are. You can run all you want to, but uh, there's news for you. Uh, I am persuaded that the people who are running the hardest are the folk that he's calling. Yeah, if you know your gift comes from God, then you've got to use it for his glory. So God raised up a man by the name of Ezekiel. And so I want you to pay close attention. It's a, it's a type, it's a parallelism that we have. And I'm not going to shout through this, and uh, we're going to just walk through this. He is one of the major prophets 
of the Bible. Look at your neighbor and say, this is not a minor situation. This is, this is a, one of the major prophets of the Bible. God called him to prophesy, spelled it wrong, while, watch this, he was in exile. What is exile, Bishop? I'm not quite sure I know what you're talking about. Exile. What is exile? What is uh, an exilic environment? What is it to mean to be in an exhilarating situation? It means, uh, it means that you're in bondage. That you're in captivity. That you're in some type of emotional, mental, physical, or financial prison. That you're in a mess and that you messed up right now. Yeah, he, he called him to prophesy while his own situation didn't look good. I, I, I mean like broke people telling folk they're getting ready to prosper. I'm talking about people with a limp saying you healed in Jesus name. Y'all ain't going to help me in here. Folk whose relationships are tore up that say God's getting ready to strengthen everything about you and your relationship. Folk who done dropped out of situations, done gave up time and time again, walking up to people, tell them, quit ye like men, be strong. God's getting ready to pull you through. I'm talking about folk prophesying whose situation is the exact opposite. Called him to prophesy while he was in bondage and captivity. It's been said by my great theologian that uh, this is not unlike many in the church today. While he was in Babylonian captivity, he gets his eternal assignment. <laughs> we want to feel liberated before we say yes to God. While he was in his most distressful situation, God gave him his eternal purpose. And his purpose was to, watch this, encourage people. Many of us have missed our assignment with God because we refuse to encourage because our circumstances was not encourageable. Here's something to think about. Look at your neighbor and say, this is Bible study. This is Bible study. This is Bible study. This is Bible study. I, I, I'm missing, but it's a good thing Jimmy ain't here tonight. Because <laughs> right now I'd be preaching and sweating by now. Because it was a couple points right there that I could have just went on up to heaven with right there. I felt it. I felt my help right there. But he was constraining me, not pushing me. Put this to your brain. Ezekiel was a priest first. Then he was called to prophesy. When you read the first chapter, it declares Ezekiel as a 30-year-old priest. That was in bondage. <laughs> you see this struggle? He was a priest called by God who was having an issue that wouldn't let him go. He was anointed to speak to the people, but himself was in captivity. In the time of his greatest and even worst struggle described by the theological world, God repositions him. takes him out of his comfort zone to get greater use out of him once he's got in his worst situation. Many of us refuse to hear God's assigning us as we watch our lives get bad. As we watch situations get tight 
as we feel people step away and abandon and reject us, we become least likely to hear God tell us to do something in the kingdom. Because remember, the priests take care of the things in the house. They speak in the temple. Prophets go out of the house. And their concern is what's going on outside the house. That's the problem with most of the prophetic in the body of Christ right now. The only people they want to preach to is the people they already see. Instead of taking the prophetic word outside of the house so somebody's life might be changed. I don't mind the prophecy, but I understand God loves me. I ain't going to say nothing right there. I'm going to leave that alone. Watch what God is doing. Making us concerned with the world. Remember, for God so loved the world, here comes the transition, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved the world. The prophetic voice of God infused in our lives is for us to go get the world. Not to play with our toys in the church. And I believe there are a lot of Ezekiels in this room right here tonight. Or God wouldn't have me say it. And I believe that I'm supposed to speak over your life tonight. I'm supposed to tell you that God is transitioning you. And that now, somebody say now. now. Say, somebody say now. now. And, and I know this is going to come as a surprise, and I'm almost scared to say it, but I know God left it on the paper so that I could say it. That your service now is not just about being a priest. But God is shifting the house into the prophetic. Now, I didn't say you get ready to run around and tell people that you're going to start telling them their future. I didn't say that he was shifting us into giving prophecy. I said he was shifting us to prophesy, to edify, to comfort, to exhort, to bring people to a place of encouragement that they can continue to believe that God is still on their side. Now, I'm not even suggesting that he won't use a word of wisdom. I'm not suggesting that he won't use a word of knowledge. I'm not just, just suggesting that he won't use a discerning of spirits. I'm not suggesting that God will not lay out somebody's next couple of days so they'll know that they're speaking to somebody that's got the truth. I'm not suggesting that God won't go deep into somebody's past and bring up something that don't nobody know about so they'll know that they're in the presence of the man or the woman of God. I'm not suggesting that they won't have that gift, but I am suggesting that even though you're going through hell, you better remind people of the heaven that's on their side. That's what I am suggesting. And that right now, God is shifting you into the prophetic. And if you believe that that's you, I dare you to just give God some praise right now. That God's going to put a word in your mouth that's going to bring somebody to another dimension. That's going to take somebody to another level. That's causing them to dig down into another depth of God's love and that they will not let the devil defeat them in their mind somebody say prophesy prophesy but watch this Ezekiel was 30 30 is the first year of the priesthood and in this same year of his priesthood he's being shifted into a prophet while he's in captivity. In other words, and if you heard the words of Ezekiel, if you go back and read the book, Ezekiel was a mature prophet. In chapter 3, somebody say two chapters later. In, two cha in chapter 3, he saw the wheel. In the middle of the wind. It didn't take long for Ezekiel to get the revelation of God's glory. He went from being an immature priest to a mature prophet overnight. I just prophesied. Didn't nobody want to receive that. 
went with from being a baby in my first assignment to acting like a grown man in my next assignment, acting like I'm an older woman in my next assignment, mature and no longer whining and crying like I was in my first assignment, but all the hell I went through in my first assignment has prepared me for my next assignment, and even though I was failing in my first assignment, I'm about to prevail in my next assignment, and it happened in one swipe of God's word. Sometimes my bishop tells me that in our immature handling of our last assignment, God is preparing you for your next assignment. It's what we learn from our failures in our previous that will be beneficial in our next. God is positioning and repositioning some people the same way he likened this to Ezekiel. Right in the midst of exile... God is speaking and begins to reveal his plans to the man of God. God is always looking for, theologically we say in need of, but we have to be careful. Okay, you say that to the wrong people, they think God need them. <laughs> they think they're think they doing God a favor. They think God owe them something. But God is in need for someone to say something about what's really going on. Not, not come to the pulpit or, or speak in the community or walk in their spheres of influence uh, just uh, hollering out cheap rhetoric and, and, and doing repetitive cliches like a parrot. But he's actually looking for somebody uh, that's going to speak to the situation. So God begins to raise up a voice or voices. He's raising up people to speak for him. Somebody say, that might be me. That might be me. And so in captivity, watch this. Because of their own mess. The children of Israel were in captivity because of their rebellion. Let me see. The group, the group, let me see. The group over here getting bothered by the devil. The group over here, you did this to yourself. So let me speak to y'all. You caused your own mess. You caused your own rebellion. You brought the stress on yourself because of disobedience and God steeped. It's getting ready to transition you from your immature failure. These were our bad decisions. Everybody say grace. These were our bad decisions. This was stuff that we miscalculated that God is working through. We're not going to blame our position on the devil all the time this was our funky attitude this is I got mad at the choir director this is I got mad on the greeter board this is I got mad at the bishop who that negro think he is this is our stuff that we done caused our own captivity this is our own pompousness that done got us Imposed into captivity in our mind. This is our dilemma, our bondage, our struggle, and whatever it is, watch this. God can speak one word in here tonight, and everything can change. How many of you could use that tonight? How many of you? God speak one word to you tonight, and everything going on crazy can change in your life that's the type of God we serve that's the type of expectancy we ought to come to the house of God with I don't know why some people come to church and don't think nothing's going to change by the time they leave if I wouldn't come hear a word if I didn't think it was a life changing word Ain't no sense in coming to spy in here. We getting ready to shout. You already know what the deal is. You can just watch it on YouTube because the same old thing going on every Wednesday and Sunday. And if we have a Friday night, somebody say shouting in here. But what if God spoke one word in here tonight and everything could change? But here's what we've got to understand. And 
I'm almost done. I'm going to get to the punchline and we're almost done. But I also know that just looking at my own life, looking at where God is taking me and what God is doing with me and where God is positioning me, why? For his glory. Why would he use me? I don't have any idea. But what I do know is that as I see myself being positioned by God, that it's going to cost me. It's going to cost me something. Because nothing in life is free. That it's got to have a cost to it or you won't appreciate it. Amen. I don't know what the price is, but I do know that there is a price that has to be paid if you're going to be used as a voice for God. I do know that there is an attack on every prophetic, every clarion voice that comes across pulpits or meets people in their place of difficulty in our spheres of influence. I do know that there would be ridicule, there will be haters, snake bites, confusion, and what some people are called friendly fire and every weapon of mass destruction that you can think of when you begin to speak on the Lord's behalf. The devil does not want a prophetic voice in the midst of folks that are in captivity. The devil wants folk to stay locked up in their minds and hearts, and he wants folk to think that there is not a word from God when they are in their sin. And see, and the devil, he's, he's smart. He doesn't just use the, the, the mentality of the people in the world, but he'll come after religious people too that'll say, while you're in your mess, God ain't going to speak to you. But what a tragedy that would be if I would be in a mess and I would be in situation and I would be jacked up and tied up and the only thing that could get me out is a word and God wouldn't give me one. So the picture here that God is sending a word, he is sending somebody with a word to people who are bound. God is speaking to his people when they are going through the worst thing that they could be going through. As a matter of fact, I already told you that the only way you're going to get out your funk is if God send you a word. The only way you're going to get life back into you is if God himself uses someone to breathe into you. Ezekiel 37, 1 through 6 says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many op in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered and said, O Lord, you know. Again, he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear what? The word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. No matter how dry our situation, God has somebody with breath enough to speak to that situation that will cause sinew and skin and meat to come on the bones. And at the end of that thing, somebody say, I'm going to dance. I'm going to dance. It doesn't matter. So what's going to bring you back to life is a word from God. It's what's going to get you up. It's a word from God. But the enemy will always try to keep you from receiving it. Watch this because he wants you to discredit the prophet. People always come against the voice that's keeping you alive. And when you go and try to speak a word of encouragement to somebody, when they find out it's you, then other people are going to try to discredit who said it because the devil don't want them to receive it. It ain't true prophecy until you've been discredited by people who are snake biting because they don't want to see the people that you're speaking to in power. When they come against your prophet, it ain't that they don't love him, it ain't that they don't love her, it's that they don't love you because they don't want to see you come up out of the mess that you might be in. They want to see you stuck in your captivity and your bondage. Look at your neighbor and say, I just want a word, I just want a word. 
if the people of Israel would have looked at their situation from the prophet standpoint, he would have been an immature, 30-year-old, snotty-nosed priest who was stuck and stuck and jacked up just like they was with as much bondage as they had. As a matter of fact, how in the world did you get in bondage? You're supposed to be the priest. Not only should you kept us out, how did you get locked up with us? And you got a nerve to come tell us to be encouraged? You got the nerve with your broke tail? to come tell us to prosper you got a nerve with your lip and tail to say by his stripes we are healed how in the world can you prophesy to me and your own life is jacked up that's what the devil does but slap three people tell them I got a word don't you matter what it looked like it don't matter how I look to you God gave me a word and I've come to deliver it <laughs> receive ye the word of the Lord and the Bible says that the ankle bone connected to the leg bone and the leg bone connected to the foot bone and all I know is that all of a sudden that thing that was dry and dead and got up and did a dance somebody shall breathe on me God is bringing a word through people who thought they were unusable through people that have been discredited because of their own captivity people who because of their own struggle and their issues that folks say he can't be, she can't be used by God. Otherwise her life, his life would be perfect. Captive and prophesying in bondage and hearing God. <laughs> Y'all ain't gonna say nothing in here. Because <laughs> uh, I remember a man <laughs> I don't know if he was in the body or out of the body, but it was around 1993, 94, and he was in captivity, in bondage because of his own stuff, because he decided to smoke crack and sell and get on the street. I, I don't know what he was doing and why God would even tap on him in the middle of his uh, reading his own little book, right there in the middle of his own bed, but he felt the word of the Lord come on him, and the word of the Lord says, you shall preach and teach to my people, you shall lead my people, and I remember that boy said, not me, Lord, I ain't no way in the world. I got a lust issue. I got a money issue. I got a pride issue. I got a greed issue. I in the hell could you use me? He said, come grace is getting ready to take you where you thought you could never go. Grace is getting ready to raise you up where you thought you would never raise up. Grace is going to put you in front of people. As a matter of fact, there's going to be kings that's going to call your name. There's going to be rulers that are going to look for you and the people will move in your city until you've given the okay, thus saith the Lord, and all I can say is, how in the world could God come mess with me in the midst of my captivity and decide that He wanted to use me to do anything? But then God said, Turn to Ezekiel chapter 24. I need to prepare you for something. Because on this journey with me, you can't let nothing hold you back. I'm getting ready to take the delight of your eyes. I'm getting ready to bring her home. And I need you to not even act like anything happened. In the morning, you shall greet the people. In the evening, huh, she gonna die. Huh? And next morning, huh, you better do what I told you to do. Huh? You don't have no choice. It ain't about her. It ain't about you. It's all about me. And if you really want to see what your life is going to be about, you better suck it up. Huh? You better act like you got something on the inside of you. You better know grace is on your side. And I already promised I'll never leave you nor forsake you he told Ezekiel I'm going to take the desire of your eyes I'm going to take something that you love something that you always wanted watch God I'm going to break your heart How the Lord loves a broken heart and a contrite spirit I've had two people, three people actually, in the last eight days say to me, 
that they weren't broken. And I said, that's too bad, because I am. I don't know how else to live, but to live broken before God. I will never try to act like I've got my life together. I am broken before God. I don't know what the ham fat I'm doing. I don't know what the flip is going on. And if God, you don't lead this journey, you might as well strike me dead right now. Because if you leave it up to me, I'm going to jack it up. I'm going to mess it up. I'm going to tear it up and I'm going to tear it down. I am broken and I need you every day to keep me surrounded, to keep me covered. I need your hands with a tight grip around me because if you loose your hands at all, whatever you pour in me, I got holes in my cistern and there's nothing I can do to keep it in my capacity. But if your hand is on me, Jabez said, and take not your hand from me. Because God specializes in making you functional in your dysfunction. Yeah, this ain't a message that you're allowed to live out of order, but it is a message to say you ain't got to try to get everything in order before God moves. All you got to do is let God. Folk lose stuff and they become dysfunctional. You watch people that, that lose a couple things. They act like their life done ended. They act like stuff can't, can't nothing move on. They act like stuff is over. They just get in a funk. They don't wash. They don't even move. They don't get anything done. They become dysfunctional because they lost what they depended on. Watch people that stuff don't go their way. They don't get the job. Somebody they know get it in front of them. Things walk away from them. People don't admire them the way they want to. The first thing they do is have a tantrum and get dysfunctional. No longer can move in the grace and the anointing that God had on their lives because stuff didn't go the way they proposed it to go. Well, I got news for you. I got a short secret. It may be God that's not letting things go your way. <laughs> here, here, here's a word of theodicy that will hurt some feelings. God is too good to let you have something, someone, or some dream in front of him. <laughs> Did you hear that? God is too good to you. He loves you too much to let something, someone, or some dream get in front of him. So every time something gets in front of God in your life, he will strike it. Watch this. Because he loves you. God, why did you do that to me? I love you. You was getting ready to mess this whole thing up by worshiping something that could kill you rather than that would lead you to life and life more abundantly. You remember what Isaiah said in the year that King Uzziah died. Watch this. He could have said, I finally saw the Lord high and lift it up. Here's the indication. He had been looking for God. But people had raised themselves up. Watch this. As a standard against God. When God was trying to raise himself up. As a standard against their enemies. So now you can't see God or your enemy. Because you got some nut in your way that wants you to worship them. You done put some dream in front of God. You can't see God or the enemy that's after you. You got, we better be careful of the King Uzziah's we done raised up in our lives. So, in one day, God says, I'm going to take out of your life the most precious thing from you. The most precious thing that you have. And I want you to act like nothing happened. 
Ezekiel 24, 16 through 19. I'm almost done. Just hold on, y'all. Son of man, I'm about to take from you the delight of your life. <clears throat> this, is, this is in the message. Watch how he says. A real blow, I know. But please, no tears. Watch this. Keep your grief. To yourself. No public mourning. That means you can't get up in the morning and put on Facebook everything somebody just did to you. You can't say, This is my situation with a smiley face, a, a frowny face. You can't say, Here's my status and it don't look joyful. Because you look ignorant the next time you try to preach, people think that you don't understand what the glory of God is and that you riding a roller coaster and you just as jacked up and confused as they are. How in the world can they give credit to the priesthood and the prophecy that you give? They already not saved and one day you talking about you want to act like you don't want to live no more and the next day you tell somebody, trust God. Keep your grief to yourself. He left. Bye-bye. She left. Bye-bye. It didn't happen. Okay. I didn't get it. Praise God. Something's got to stay consistent if God's going to keep using you. He said get dressed as usual and go about your work. None of the usual funeral rituals. Watch what Ezekiel said. I preach to people, to the people in the morning. That evening, my wife died. The next morning, I did as I'd been told. The people came to me saying, tell us why you're acting like this. Your testimony isn't telling people what happened. Your testimony is telling people why you're able to act like you're acting when they know what already happened. We run around trying to give people the skinny on what went down. That ain't glorifying God. Let them find out the skinny. Come ask you, why in the world you ain't lost your mind? And you say, huh, I serve a risen master. I serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Yeah, I, it don't feel real good. But ain't no way in the world I could come before the public with mourning and with a downtrodden heart. And he's been too good to me. I, I know that this is a jacked up situation. But most of it I brought on myself. But God is rich in mercy. And in spite of how I've acted and how I've been he's been real good to me so the only thing that I can do is shout hallelujah in the midst of the hell that I'm going through it ain't hallelujah it's hallelujah I just got to look at this thing a little differently I just got to consider what I'm going through it ain't hell it's how I look at your neighbor and say, I'm going through hallelujah. I'm going through hallelujah. It feels like a hallelujah. I know I want to say what the hallelujah. And God will get the glory. Tell us why you're acting like this. This is the same thing they said to Jesus in the boat. Master. I mean, we done seen you do some amazing stuff and obviously you can sleep underwater, but don't you care that we dying? So what's going on here? What is God saying? God is saying, I'm, I'm done with the lesson. God is saying we're going to have to get to the point when something's taken away from us that we love We've got to keep on serving him and acting like nothing's going on. We got to keep moving just like ain't nothing happened. Because if we don't and we allow that to detour how we serve, then in actuality, we've put that thing or that person or that dream in front of God. 
So tonight is just an indicator for you to understand what you're worshiping. Because if something or someone or some dream interrupts my enthusiasm for serving God, I wasn't serving God because he's worthy. I was serving God for those things. When they take away our rights, the preaching can't change. When they take prayer out of schools, the preaching can't change. When they threaten to take away our tax-exempt status, our preaching can't change. Here, here is the marquee scripture or the marquee statement for tonight. I probably should have said this, took an offering and went home. I'd have saved a sweatsuit and a whole lot of sweat, and I wouldn't have had to take a shower before I leave the building. The call on your life is greater than the cry from your life. The call on your life. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Bishop Mack. The call on your life is greater than the cry from your life. The glory of God comes from the call and the assignment that's on your life. It intrudes the rest of your life. But the rest of your life, you cannot let suffocate the assignment on your life. Somebody say his call is greater than my cry. We're going to go through tough times. We're going to suffer tribulation. There's going to be trials, trepidation, all of that stuff. You've got habits and issues and proclivities and tendencies and all the words that we can think of. There's going to be mistakes and bad choices and, 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 and rash decisions and all of those things are going to happen because of the duplicity of our humanity. The fact that we are still human with the divine nature on the inside of us. Stuff and things is going to happen. But we've got to stay focused on what God has called us to do. Today I was asked the ultimate question. Not by a devil, but by a dear brother of God. I was asked the ultimate question with dollar signs on the paper, with figures already presented, with a model already intact, at four o'clock today, I was asked to consider leaving the ministry for a full-time work in something that would be financed by some of the richest people in this city. Ministry, it would be, but it ain't the call. And I said, before I could even muster up my own answer, and I know it was the Holy Ghost. The only reason this mission prospers is because of the call of God on my life. If I abandon the call, the mission will deteriorate. You don't want me to leave the house of God and serve a ministry that wasn't my original call. These are the toes of my original baby. I can't throw the baby out and expect the bath water to still be sweet. I've got to preach the gospel. I've got to stand firm until God changes my position. In the meantime, we're going to trust that this little mission of ours, that it's going to keep on prospering, that God's going to keep on blessing it. That y'all going to keep pouring your money into it. And you're going to keep believing that God's doing it over and over again. Generation after generation. Child after child. Teen after teen. We're going to believe that God's got something great in store. But sir, I promise you that I am too afraid to abandon my original call without another word from God. It's the only thing that releases his grace on my life. And I said, and sir... Here's the sad part. I know what you're looking at. I know what you see. I understand what you're beholding. I recognize you've investigated 
and it don't even look like I've been doing a good job. But good job or not, I can't leave my call just because I got to cry. It's greater than what's going on with me. So I'm saying to you, you can't mourn too long. You can't keep breaking down. Nobody really needs to know what you're going through until God wants to use it. You can't keep reacting like everybody else. You've got to stand up and be strong. So I'm going to prophesy. And then we're going to go home. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Prompt yourself. Get ready. Because this is from God. I believe it with all of my heart. To his people that may be shifting from priest to the prophetic that he wants to give a word to in the midst of your own trial and trepidation hear ye the word of the Lord grow up grow up it's time for another dimension in his glory for your life it's just simply time to grow up again. I remember at 10, my mother said, grow up. I remember at 14, she said, grow up. I remember at 17, she said, grow up. I remember at 21, my daddy said, grow up. I remember when I went to prison, they said, you got to grow up. I remember when she died. Pastor Art said, grow up. I remember when I came home, my daddy said, grow up. I remember when my first tragedy came, I heard Abner say, grow up. And every day I hear my bishop say, grow up. It's not about throwing up your hands. It's not about giving up. It's about growing up. And if I don't grow up, I'll never go up. So wash your face, anoint your head, let out a shout. Nobody needs to know that you're in captivity. Nobody needs to know you've lost some earthly things. Nobody needs to know that you can't sleep at night. But here was Ezekiel's dilemma while you're still standing. Folk are going to think when stuff go down and you don't react the way they thought you were, that you didn't even care about it. But you can't worry about what folk think. God took Ezekiel's wife to prepare him for where he was taking him. Sometimes the only way we can get ready to go further is if we lose something. It's going to cost you some sleepless nights. It's going to cost you some stuff going wrong in your body. It's going to cost you some stuff messing with your mind. You're going to make some major mistakes and you're going to participate in some of the sins of Babylon. But in spite of it all, the call is still greater than the cry. Simply said, a charge to keep I have and a God to glorify. You're going to lose family or friends. You're going to have to give up on personal aspirations and some dreams and some goals. It's going to cost something to be used by God. But God wants us. He needs us right now because we're the family of God. We're the remnant. We're the people of God. We've got to stay consistent. We've got to stay focused. You've got to put off some things. Don't worry about playing that. Another move. You've got to put off some things. And you've got to let God have your way. Before we give, grab that. step it back and we'll put it back in a minute I want you to make a step into God's repositioning of you and come to this altar if you're ready to grow up again now everybody don't have to come because when you do it it means it's going to cost you something but if we're ready for what God wants to do next listen God wants to pour out his glory he wants to pour out his resources he wants to use what thought they were unusable. God wants to cause us to 
see him in, in, in a new and fresh way. He wants revelation knowledge to come. But there may have to be some things that have to be removed in order for us to see him clearly. And some of us may already be in that place where some stuff was removed and we're, things that we wanted to happen is not happening and things that we thought would go our way isn't going our way. We may already be there and not understanding why it's going on like that. Well, God came tonight with this lesson that it's so that he can take us to the next place. But that grace is on our lives. It cost. We didn't think that it did. We, we heard free. And God's riches at Christ's expense. So we kind of figured we didn't have anything to do with it. There was no participation on our part. But we didn't know that we couldn't carry that burden and this burden at the same time. That something had to give way. That there had to be a sacrifice. And sometimes that sacrifice is difficult because it comes in things that we love and things that we've worked hard for, things that we think that we've earned, things that we put our lives in and invested for. It comes in that way. But God says, how much do you love me? And sometimes it's not our mistake. Sometimes it's somebody did something to us and we had to suffer a wrong. But the Bible says, if you'll suffer with him, you shall also what? Reign with him. And so it's the paradox of our faith. Some things got to go down before some things can go up. Some things have to die before they can be resurrected. But isn't it good to know that if God gave you something and you think that it died, <clears throat> that it shall live again? It has to. Somebody just needs to breathe on it. And I'm also going to pray, and I'm, I'm just prophesying while I'm praying even now, that God would protect your heart and your ears from people trying to discredit the prophet in your life. That when people come with a word from God, that when people have an encouraging word for you, that people wouldn't come behind that and say that you shouldn't listen to them. That God has blessed you to hear the word of the Lord for your life. And then I'm praying that God wouldn't let people discredit your efforts either. That as you go forward, giving the word of the Lord, not needing to be puffed up, not wanting to be heard, but being obedient to God in what you say, that people wouldn't discredit you so that the people that heard your voice wouldn't miss a word from God. Immature as a priest, mature as a prophet, overnight, he woke Ezekiel up and said, prophesy. I want to speak to some gifts that's been sleep on this altar tonight. And I want to speak to that gift and I want to say prophesy. You've been horrible in your first assignment, but all your failures are getting ready to prepare you for your next assignment. And now you'll be great because of the lessons you learned. It failed. You didn't do it. You backed up. You quit. You didn't go forward. You didn't give full effort. You procrastinated. You wasn't determined. All those things happened in your first assignment. But God said, I'm going to use all of that now to propel you into your next assignment and your next assignment will come with a greater level of maturity and it'll happen so quick it'll make people's heads spin that God will use you in the exact place where you thought you were no longer usable so Father I thank you for your word I thank you for the way that you love us. You love us so much that you won't let stuff and people and dreams get in front of you. You are so good to us that when it looks like you have stricken us, when it looks like you have hurt us, you're actually healing us. You're preparing us. You're moving us into our next dimension. God, I thank you for the people that have come tonight, for everyone that's heart is at this altar, for everyone whose hands are raised, for everyone whose hearts are raised. God, even watching by the internet tonight that need a fresh touch, that need a fresh word that need a breath of fresh air God that you would send something even if it was tonight prophetic into their lives that people can't discredit because they'll know by the baby that leaped on the inside heal tonight God finances heal tonight physical bodies heal tonight mentalities and emotions heal tonight discord and animosity heal tonight pain from the past heal tonight resentment and bitterness and anger heal tonight God that inferiority complex heal tonight God that selflessness and fake humility that really comes and thinking that we're less than heal tonight arrogance and pride and people who feel like they don't need to be broken heal tonight God that we would be able to be humbled and genuflected in front of you bow down
down with everything off of us, our crowns and our adulation and everything that we think pumps us up and props us up. Let it fall tonight, God, that we might fall before you. Help us tonight, God. Shift us tonight, God. I received the word from your man of God today. Shift in us now, God. Reposition us now, God. Anoint us afresh. Anoint us afresh. In the midst of our affliction, in the midst of our bondage, in the midst of our captivity, new songs from Zion. Stronger prayer. Fresh revelation of your word. Bring your life off the pages to us, God. Make your word become flesh. Life on life. Incarnation ministry in our hearts, God. Help us to be your hands and your feet, oh God. Give us the backbone and the courage of our Savior whose face was fixed like a flint looking forward to the glory of being reacquainted with you help us to acquaint now ourselves with you and be at peace and we know in that place good shall come unto us fall afresh with your blessings upon these people God bless us, bless us, bless us indeed expand and extend our territories Take not your holy hand from us. Keep us from the evil one. Keep us from harm. That we might not rebel and sway away from you. We thank you. You're an awesome God. You're a loving Father. Perfect creator. Sovereign and ruler. And we bless you. Prepare our hearts to be used now, God, like never before. Make our tongues like the pen of a ready writer. Increase the capacity of your grace on the inside of us. Removing doubt and fear. And even sin that's not been repented of. We love you so much, sir. We need you. We avail ourselves. Even at the cost. And we declare without fear. Use us for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on and give God some praise right there. Come on and bless him. Come on. How many of you know he's risen from the dead? <laughs> and he is Lord to the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Just while he's playing that song, just a sweet melody, just grab your, go to your pocket, your purse, grab your gift, just bring it straight up. It's blessed now in Jesus' name. Just bring your gift and be dismissed. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for receiving our sacrifice and our offering in every seed. We planted in good soil tonight and we expect a harvest, not because we deserve it, because your word has already declared it. We love you, sir, and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give yourself away. Come on, he's saying, he's playing. Come on. Give myself away. Give myself away. So you can use me. Give myself away. Thank you.